There's an old and rather corny gif from the mid-2000s that tries to sum up the state of wrestling in various nations that you'd often see people sporting on certain wrestling forums. I can't remember it exactly, but it went something like, in Canada it's family, in Mexico it's a tradition, in Japan it's a sport, and in the US it's a joke. With the last part accompanied by a picture of Shawn Michaels being forced to kiss Vince McMahon's ass. Anywho, this relied on bullshit that was so very common back in the day. That wrestling is treated with great respect in places like Japan, where there's no such thing as classic wrestling sleaze. People treat it like a sport, everyone is thoroughly respectful and professional, treating their fellow man with the utmost care. Disgusting figures like Triple H or Hulk Hogan with their backstage politicking and creative control clauses wouldn't get anywhere in the world of Puro. And the sight of a man kissing his boss's ass in the middle of the squared circle would simply leave the average Japanese fan shaking their heads in dismay. Of course, Japanese wrestling is filled with as much sleaze, as much politicking, and as many assholes as just about anywhere else. Much the same applies to Lucha Libre, and entire books have been written on the hellscape of dysfunction that is the Hart family. The only thing that's really true is that wrestling in Japan has fairly often been presented as if it were a sport. But if anything, that just makes it easier for things to go on, and for people to go into business for themselves. For if there's one glorious thing that sums up this ruthless business that we all enjoy for our sins, is when one or two people use the veneer of a sporting contest, or of sports entertainment or whatever, to settle personal grudges, air their company grievances, bully someone or... Hell, just to get into a fight because they feel like it. In this video, we have several examples of Japanese wrestling matches that went quite wrong and dissolved into shoots. Instead of trying to collect everything, we're going to try and link a few matches together as a way of, in particular, telling the story of shoot style. In many ways, the popularity of shoot style pro wrestling, which led to the rise of MMA in Japan, is defined by several incidents of matches that went utterly wrong. Famous acts of people going into business for themselves, famous double crosses, and all that sort of good thing. There's going to be a fair bit of fun in this video too. Some of these stories are just <laughs> outrageous. In the end though, you actually enjoy ProRes a lot more when you cut out all of the vaguely orientalist bullshit of respect, tradition, and sport that surrounds it. It would be one to start with anyone except one of the most popular figures in the history of Puro. A man who came up from very little, spent most of his adolescence in fricking gans like a real life Kunio kun before attaining stardom, but never got rid of that gan mentality and, well, if he wasn't getting what he wanted he'd be damn sure to take it, regardless of what that entailed. I speak, of course, of Japanese wrestling's most famous bad boy, Akira Maeda. You cannot do a video about Japanese wrestling's shoot incidents, and the ones that made shoot style in particular, without Akira Maeda, for there are three in particular that are very famous. Maeda rose to fame in New Japan in the early 80s as a very hot young talent, someone basically destined for the main event, a perfect combination of size, athleticism, skill and charisma. With other younger stars in this generation, including the likes of the original Tiger Mask and Tatsumi Fujinami, alongside the more established folks such as Yoshiaki Fujiwara, Ricky Chosu, and Inoki, not to mention a certain incredibly popular American called Hulk Hogan, you'd think New Japan would be pretty set to match or even better the product of their hated rivals, All Japan. But of course, things tend to work out differently. And this particular generation of New Japan talent was often marred by rather messy disputes and breakups, the first of which occurred in 1984 when, dissatisfied with the direction of New Japan's wrestling and yearning for a more legitimate appearing product, Maeda, Fujiwara and Tiger Mask, or rather Satoru Sayama, broke away from the company to form the original Universal Wrestling Federation, or UWF. Now quickly for those who may not be familiar, how was the product that this trio wanted to present different to that of New Japan or All Japan? Well, the original UWF was the beginning of something commonly known as shoot style, meaning that the fights take on a much more legitimate appearance. 
the wrestling and psychology centers around grappling and striking, with much less in the way of traditional pro wrestling moves. You won't find any Irish rips, body slams, or outside the ring brawling here. It's mostly about working for a submission or a knockout. In most cases, shoot style even does away with the traditional three count pinfall. Instead, there's often a point system in place where both wrestlers start with a set number of points and they lose them if they're knocked down or if they have to escape a submission via the ropes. If those points drop to zero, then the wrestler loses, although in practice most matches end up finishing before that happens. Now, is shoot style any good? Well, yes, it's bloody brilliant when performed well, totally different from the big styles, but with its own spin on storytelling and psychology. If you like technical wrestling at all, then you really need to check out the best of Shoot Style. Usefully, this vid's going to be covering two of its most major practitioners. The original UWF was a fine experiment, not to mention also being a popular one. While not fully doing away with pinfalls and what have you just yet, crowds welcomed the Federation's new approach. They even struck up an international agreement with the WWF for a short time, and their roster includes some very strong youngsters like Nobuhiko Takada and Kazuo Yamazaki. However, primarily thanks to the big egos of the three main guys involved and their own differing philosophies of just what shoot styles should be, it only lasted one year before being dissolved. The trouble mostly lay with how Satoru Sayama carried himself. Massively over thanks to his time as Tiger Mask in New Japan, he was undoubtedly the top star of this new promotion and he also held creative control. Sayama, like Maeda, is, well, something of a hot-headed personality. He had legit martial arts skills which he certainly put to use as a wrestler and, well, as a trainer. God help those who show poor form while he's stomping about the dojo, cane in hand. Anyway, Sayama was the top star, and in his eyes, no one else should basically even get a look in. He almost never lost. Maeda, who had legit skills of his own, in particular took umbrage to this, and when they met in the ring, the results would usually be pretty bloody stiff, with very few strikes pulled. In Japan, having a stiff match is referred to as going cement, and they did this often. But it was on September 2nd, 1985, when it would all very much come to a head, or rather, a knee. This match between Maeda and Sayama, for the most part, is somewhat sedate. Most of it's spent on the ground, making it one for the grapple fans. The crowd, as is often the case with shoot style matches, watches largely in silence. It's not exactly something I'd show to a shoot style newbie, really. All is rather calm and normal until around the 20 minute mark, when suddenly, out of nowhere, Maeda knees Sayama square in the groin. There's not a whole lot of mistake in it, and Sayama somewhat crumples in spite of his attempts to no-sell the ball shot. It's all quite weird. Sayama doesn't seem to argue anything despite just being kneed in the dick. The crowd is almost totally stunned with a delayed reaction to Luef calling for disqualification, and Maeda simply walks out of the ring. It's very strange indeed, but that was Maeda's way of registering his dissatisfaction. This knee to the groin had an impact. In fact, it was basically the end for the UWF. They ran two more scheduled shows over the next few days before Sayama immediately left the company after the tour was over and, in fact, left pro wrestling as a whole for over a decade. With the UWF's top star gone, the remaining wrestlers saw little point in carrying on and decided to dissolve. Most everybody, including Maeda, made their way back to New Japan. But Maeda's double cross had kind of worked out for him, increasing his notoriety to no end. When he came back to New Japan, he was over as all hell. He'd certainly attracted the attention of the Big Chin himself. The build-up to Maeda's second famous shoot incident lies in his somewhat mixed history with Antonio Inoki. With his legit trappings and his personality and so forth, Maeda was seen in a fair few circles as basically Inoki's successor, perhaps even by the man himself. All the way back in 1983, Maeda was booked to go all the way to the finals of the inaugural IWGP tournament, where he eventually lost to the Big Chin. And now that he was back, Inoki was pretty intent on setting up a big program between himself and Maeda, which ultimately never took place. 
Accounts differ as to why Inoki Maeda never happened back then. It certainly would have been a big deal. Some say Inoki wasn't willing to put over Maeda, which is almost certainly true. And on the other side, well, Maeda wasn't exactly willing to put over Inoki. As previously mentioned, Maeda was very outspoken and, well, if he didn't like something, then he most likely wouldn't have done it. If he thought he was a superior fighter to you, then he did not like jobbing to you. That much was absolutely certain. He clearly didn't see anything in ultimately coming out on the losing end of a feud with Inoki. He guessed, probably accurately, that Inoki wouldn't give him an inch if they'd worked together. One of the things that's often talked about with Maeda is the dysfunctional relationship between himself and New Japan's head office. He was, as mentioned, very over with the fans, but he was always seen as an outsider. Indeed, that was entirely of his own choice. Maeda would make comments in the press proclaiming himself and the UWF as legitimate, unlike other fake wrestlers and promotions, including his paymasters. Yes, he was more than happy to expose the business in this manner, in a way that would make Jim Cornette have a freaking coronary, over a decade before Russo-mania. This sort of thing, as difficult as it made Maeda to work with, is why he's one of the most important wrestlers in the history of pro res. Hell, one of the most important people in the history of combat sports in Japan. Maeda was the original outsider. The blueprint for so many others, often all with something of a legit background, or at least presented as having a legit background. Minoru Suzuki, Katsuyori Shibata, Masakatsu Fanaki, Shinsuke Nakamura, even the likes of Toshiaki Kawada, Shinya Hashimoto and many more, although they're usually a lot more refined, you can trace them back to Maeda. He was incredibly ahead of his time, and very controversial. It's mentioned that New Japan's head office wanted to bring Maeda down a peg or two, perhaps understandably so considering his obviously massive ego. Perhaps this was the intention of getting him in there with Inoki, which Maeda managed to avoid. So instead they brought in one of the most famous and most imposing wrestlers of all time to teach Maeda a lesson. Or so they thought. On the 26th of May 1986, Akira Maeda would be in the ring, staring down the other end at Andre the Giant. The result would be one of the most uncooperative and strangest matches in the history of Japanese pro wrestling. What we have here, initially, seems to be very typical for Andre matches. It's David versus Goliath, isn't it? Even at 6 foot 3, Maeda is dwarfed by Andre. But it becomes clear early on that something's just kind of off. Andre spends most of the time in the centre of the ring, swaying. He does take Maeda down a couple of times and lays on him, but they don't seem to be working together at all. Maeda then returns the favour, picking Andre's leg and taking him down, working for submission holds. But again, there's just not much cooperation. Certainly no selling or anything like that either. And from here, after only a few minutes, well, the match just completely devolves into farce. Over half of this match consists of Andre swaying in the middle of the ring while Maeda circles him and throws low kicks. They start off kind of light, but most certainly get harder as it becomes clear that, well, Andre isn't cooperating at all. There's different theories for this. Again, there's the theory that Inoki and the head office wanted Andre to teach Maeda a lesson. There's also the possibility that Andre is pissed out of his head to the point where he is not selling. Obviously he's known for drinking, although he's also known for a quite legendary capacity for alcohol, so God knows how much he would have to have drunk to get this paralytic to not know where he was, if that was the case. I think it likelier that he just decided, or was told, to be a dick. It becomes clear that if Andre was brought in to rough up Maeda, it was the one choice. Sure, his reputation preceded him. In the 1980s, Andre was thought of as the toughest man in the business just based on his sheer size and his rep. But by 1986, he was already somewhat immobile, even compared to a few years previous. Ten minutes have passed, Andre is completely gassed and can barely move, it's kind of clear that moving is somewhat painful, and it's only going to get worse with each kick. Even now though, there's no sense of cooperation. Andre certainly isn't going to sell these kicks. Maeda doesn't really want to do much else. The referee, who so happens to be Andre's travelling partner, is completely out of his depth. A more experienced guy could have perhaps done something to at least try and help engineer a finish of sorts, but this man is not experienced. 
The crowd are hot but utterly confused, and the only person who seems to be working at all is the New Japan heel manager in Andre's corner, Kantaro Hoshino. Maedo is clearly in conversation with Hoshino at several points, apparently he's asking Hoshino if he can finish Andre off, and Hoshino is saying no. Twenty minutes in, Inoki himself comes out, as the match has now come to little but Andre and Maeda arguing at each other, as if both think the other is uncooperative. And indeed, no one comes out of this smelling of roses. By now Maeda can, and indeed does, take down Andre at will, and eventually Andre just refuses to get up. You can see him basically say, pin me, pin me, to Maeda. At this point, Inoki enters the ring, Maeda's seconds do the same and start a bit of a fracas, and finally this is enough for the referee to get the message and throw the match out. It's a no contest. The whole thing is… yeah, it's one of the strangest things I've ever watched. It's absolutely ridiculous and, yet again, kind of important, certainly memorable. You get the impression that Maeda could have done more to Andre if he'd chosen to. Dick Murdoch, who happened to be on the same card, thought that Maeda could have ended Andre's career on that night, and some have wondered if all those kicks did cause lasting damage, making Andre even more immobile. It certainly wasn't a good night for the Eighth Wonder, that's for sure. As you can no doubt tell, New Japan were not in a good state at this time. What with shit like this going on, amidst various other scandals that had hurt the company, they were kind of in the dumps. One of these scandals resulted in the departure of Ricky Choshu, one of the top stars. More than that, he jumped ship to All Japan. Choshu's year or so in AJPW resulted in the very successful Ishingun Invading Army storyline, the one that Eric Bischoff cited as a major inspiration when it came to creating the New World Order. Comparatively speaking, New Japan? Well, they were in the shithouse. Maeda was one of the top stars, but his submission focus style wasn't necessarily pulling in fans. This on the whole is just an awkward period, it's just before the rise of the Three Musketeers, Muto, Hashimoto and Chono, that would start to turn things around. In the middle of 1987, Choshu takes a big money offer to come back to New Japan, where naturally he's going to be going straight back to the main event. This results in a very awkward split, both between camps of wrestlers and New Japan's fans. You've got Maeda and his supporters, who want to see more of the shoot style action with its increased focus on legitimacy and realism and all of that, and then you have the fans of Choshu. His return is seen hopefully as a return to traditional New Japan strong style and, well, basically pro wrestling. Maeda is obviously unhappy that Choshu has come back to the main event, and while he's far from the only one, with many others pissed that Chosu can just come back in from defecting to the rival promotion with a huge deal like nothing's happened, Maeda's anger also lies in, well, an inferior practitioner of fake pro wrestling coming in and taking his spot. Maeda is very opinionated, and openly thinks less of the regular pro wrestling style. It's clearly an untenable situation, although the way that it did resolve itself was <laughs> certainly a shock. On November 19th, 1987, a six-man tag match takes place at the Koaken Hall between the teams of Maeda, Nobuhiko Takada and Osamu Kido, and Chosyu, Masa and Hiro Saito. The Koaken crowd is very pro Maeda, cheering everything he does on. It's kind of like a red rag to a bull, just goading him to do something. This is the time to take the opportunity. And guess what? He does. About ten minutes in, Chosu puts Kido into one of his favourite holds, the Sasori Gatame, you know, the Scorpion Deathlock or Sharpshooter. And to break it up, Maeda chooses to very casually saunter up behind him and then, well, shoot kick him in the fucking head. The kick, which Chosu would have not seen coming in, lands square in the right eye and breaks Chosu's orbital bone. Choshu does a pretty impressive job of no-selling the kick, all things considered, before realising just what has happened and going after Maeda. The match ends only a couple of minutes later in a no contest, with Choshu bleeding from his right eye and huge chants of Maeda, Maeda. The crowd seemed to figure out what happened pretty sharpish. New Japan had no choice but to suspend Maeda after the incident, which was kind of weird. In doing so, they kind of had to expose the business some more, seeing as Maeda was suspended for a kick. Chosu, while naturally pissed, wasn't blind to the opportunity. 
He publicly begged for New Japan to rescind Maeda's suspension so that they could fight in a programme that, well, would have been huge in all likelihood. But this didn't happen. Maeda never entered a New Japan ring again after shoot kicking Choshu. Ultimately, it was decided that Maeda was more trouble than he was worth, and he was fired in 1988. We've spent a lot of time on these three incidents in particular because they are by far the most important things we're going to be talking about here. They changed the course of Puro history. After being fired, Maeda set the UWF up again. They did great business, even becoming the first pro wrestling company to run a show in the Tokyo Dome, but again, they only lasted about a year. The main men behind UWF all set up different promotions, Yoshiaki Fujiwara's Fujiwara Gumi, Nobuhiko Takada's UWFI, and Akira Maeda's Rins, all of which make big impacts. Satoru Sayama sets up what is basically Japan's first major MMA promotion, Shuto. The exploits of Maeda in particular are a huge step in the foundations of MMA in Japan. And yeah, there is still the odd incident. Woe betide Wataru Sakata, who Maeda deemed to have not put too much of an effort in after a match in Rins. He has a massive ego, a short fuse, and some may say he's a bit of a bully and sociopath, but Maeda is certainly a pioneer. Now, we will be going back to shoot style shenanigans pretty soonish, but let's have a look at the prelude to another famous sequence. This time it's 1991, and we're headed to SWS, Genichiro Tenryu's popular but very short-lived promotion that he formed after leaving All Japan, mostly famous for running a few cards in collaboration with the WWF and featuring top stars. Tenryu himself had bouts against both Hogan and Randy Savage during this period. One of the more memorable matches from the company, though, took place between two former Rikishis, sumo wrestlers, who perhaps weren't too happy to see each other. And of course, it's famous for all the wrong reasons. Who do we have in this match, then? Well, first off, we have John Earthquake Tenter, who you may already know, being a successful WWF guy and all. A fair bit was made at times out of his background in sumo wrestling, including that one no ropes match he had against Yokozuna, but just what was that background? Well, it was somewhat successful, but very brief. Taking the name Koto Tenzan, Tenta won all 24 bouts he took part in in his career, enough to take him to the rank of Makushita 43. He did make waves and had potential, but after just 8 months he decided to leave Sumo for several reasons, partly due to the physical toll it was already taking on him, and partly because he was unwilling to get rid of the tiger tattoo on his bicep, which the Wrestlers Association had basically told him he had to do in order to advance to the higher levels. Tenta went back to the West to retrain as a pro wrestler, and the rest is history. He adapts to pro wrestling pretty sharpish, becoming a quite entertaining and surprisingly athletic big man. His opponent was a man named Koji Kitao. Was he more successful in sumo? Well, I should say so. Kitao, under the name of Futahaguro, reached the top rank of Yokozuna. That said, he is perhaps the worst Yokozuna in the modern history of the sport. He achieved the promotion by default due to a shortage of Yokozunas and abundance of Ozekis, won no tournaments while in the top rank, and in 1987 was expelled from Sumo entirely after an argument with his stable boss, during which he hit said stable boss's wife. This after already getting the reputation of being too physical with his junior stable mates. Futa Huguro is the only former Yokozuna in the history of the sport to never win a top division tournament in the entirety of his career. Although, obviously, he did have a far more successful career than Kota Tenzan. Like Tenta, after Sumo he retrained as a pro wrestler, and debuted in 1990 for New Japan, later joining his friend and fellow ex-Rikishi Genichiro Tenryu in SWS. Kitao's pro wrestling career was pretty short, but eventful. It even included a WrestleMania match. At WrestleMania 7 in 1991, he and Tenryu won a pretty nothing match against the Smash Crush version of Demolition. The infamous match against Earthquake would come just a couple of weeks later in Kobe on April 1st, 1991. The two former Rikishis were booked against each other. And as you might expect, with Kitao still being pretty new to wrestling and Earthquake being a well-established upper mid-card in WWF, Tenta was booked to win. Kitao was absolutely furious about doing the job to Tenta due to Le Pair's sumo careers. 
he considered Tenta to be utterly inferior to him as a sumo, and therefore inferior as a pro wrestler. So, there's not an awful lot to the short match, really. Kitao is utterly uncooperative right from the off. He does not make any attempt to sell anything that Tenta does, and even throws the odd stiff punch or two. Tenta doesn't seem particularly phased by any of them. It is an absolutely ridiculous affair. I suppose that these two wouldn't have had much of a match if they'd actually worked one, mind you. This is far more memorable. After a few minutes, the referee attempts to restrain Kitao, who responds with a shoot kick on the official, and this is enough for the disqualification. But it didn't end there. Kitao then decided to get on the microphone and pull a Maeda, calling Earthquake a faker, saying that wrestling was fake and that he wasn't going to be doing any more jobs while others restrained him. The whole thing then spilled over to the back, with Kitao apparently threatening Tenta with violence which left Tenta, by all accounts one of wrestling's nicest guys, utterly nonplussed and unbothered. And the entire locker room was in a total rage at what Kitao had done. Because you see, there's something of a difference between Maeda and Kitao, mainly popularity and talent. Maeda could get away with it somewhat, but Kitao? Well, he was shit. And also, everyone hated him. In the short time he'd been a wrestler, he had given the impression of being short-fused, arrogant, and nigh on impossible to work with. SWS had basically no choice but to fire him, even if it possibly meant that Kitao could go babble into the papers and expose the business even further. It later came out that while Tenta hadn't taken the advice, SWS's booker, the great Kabuki, had actually encouraged him to shoot on Kitao because that would piss him off royally and quite possibly result in something like what happened. It turned out that wasn't necessary for Kitao entered the match already pissed off enough. Kabuki also lost his job for doing that. So we have a bit of an omni shambles here, don't we? Koji Kitao came to wrestling with his reputation in tatters after a scandal forced him out of sumo, and guess what? He leaves SWS with his reputation in tatters once more. It wasn't expected that any promotion whatsoever was going to hire Kitao after his antics and after his business exposing. But of course, they would be one. In the world of pro wrestling, there is always a way back in. And guess what the result of Kitao's re-entry into Puro would be? Yep, another shoot incident. Okay, we're going back into the world of shoot style. It's now time to concentrate a bit on Nobuhiko Takada and his promotion, Union of Wrestling Forces International, or UWF International, or simply UWFI. UWFI is, as mentioned, one of the many promotions that spun off from Maeda's second UWF, and it's not only one of the more high-profile ones, it's also one of the strangest. Whereas something like Maeda's Rins tried to stick strictly to martial artists for their largely worked shoot-style matches, including people like the Russian Sambo Volk Hun, who turned out to be freaking amazing at shoot-style, UWFI was a lot more inclusive. You have a wild mix, from the big stars like Takada, Kazuo Yamazaki, Kiyoshi Tamura and Yoji Anjo, to Len Yun Lines, Kazushi Sakuraba and Yoshihiro Takayama, to a rather intriguing mix of foreign talent. You've got everyone from guys like Gary Albright, who made a name for themselves here, to some rather old hands like Billy Robinson, Bob Backlund and Nick Bockwinkle, and then some total wildcards, which would include someone like the recently blacklisted and notorious Koji Kitao. Kitao made his return to wrestling in 1992 for UWFI. He only wrestled for the promotion twice, and his second match against Takada is the one that we're talking about. As you might expect with a high maintenance figure like Kitao, there was a lot of negotiation as to what the result of the match between the two was going to be. Ultimately it's settled, Takada and Kitao are going to go to a three round draw. No harm, no fuss. And for most of their match, which took place on 23rd of October 1992, that's pretty much what happens. It's not exactly a good match. While Kitao had taken some martial arts training between his firing from SWS and this match, he's still kind of a lummox, and Takada, while a pretty talented pro wrestler, can't do all that much with him. It's all quite mundane, until the third round. It all happens in no time at all. The two circle each other, Takada throws two pretty harsh low kicks that get the crowd going a little, but then his third kick? It's an exocet launched directly towards Kitao's skull, and it connects fully. It's beautiful. Krokop-esque. It's the greatest strike Takada will ever throw in his career, 
although it is slightly disqualified on account of Kitao hardly expecting to be kicked directly in the gob. In any case, Kitao is knocked the f*** out, and the ref promptly does the honours. UWFI's homegrown talent celebrates with Takada in the win. So, um, yeah. Takada decided to change the finish to his match with Kitao on the fly. He just didn't tell Kitao anything about it. While Takada could be quite stiff with his kicks, he accidentally knocked out Bob Backlund just a few minutes into their first bout, there's no doubt that the kick he threw against Kitao went exactly as planned. Perhaps surprisingly, and perhaps also because he's just had his head kicked clean off, Kitao doesn't argue about the double cross. Instead, he shakes Takada's hand before leaving Lewin, almost respecting the strategy. Fair play, I guess. Perhaps he figured something like that was bound to happen with his reputation. Kitao's final few years in the business, which were generally spent shacking back up with old friend Ten Ryu in his Wrestle and Romance promotion, were largely much more professional than his beginnings. He even dabbled a bit in MMA. You can find him on the very first Pride card where he got his only win in the sport against, of all people, future WWE reject Nathan Jones. Koji Katao sadly passed away from renal failure in 2019, aged just 55. As for Takada? Well, the Kitao double cross was obviously high profile. This event was a big boost to UWFI's standing. Such ruthless acts tend to be a win if you pull them off as cleanly as Takada did. Perhaps Kitao should have looked at Takada's form book, mind you. If he had, he'd have seen that he had previous in the fine art of double crossing and might have chosen to keep his hands up more often. In 1991, Takada would take a legit professional sportsman into the UWFI ring and then proceed to screw the hell out of them. Who's the victim this time? Of all people, it's Trevor Burbick. Burbick is mainly famous for two fights. He was Muhammad Ali's last ever opponent, and he was the man who Mike Tyson defeated in 1986 for his first heavyweight championship. It may not be much, but I suppose not many people can say they had a small supporting role in the careers of two greats. That is, if Burbick could say anything at all. Unfortunately, he's also famous for his quite nasty criminal history and ultimately being rather violently bludgeoned in 2006 over a land dispute by two people, including his own nephew. Not a nice end, to say the least. Anywho, in 1991, Takada would set up his own personal Ali vs Inoki. Only even better, of course, because he's facing a man who defeated Muhammad Ali. Sure, it was in 1981, and the greatest should have long retired before then, but it still counts. Again, there were a fair amount of negotiations going into this contest. It's said that the UWFI paid Burbick $75,000 for the match, but it is possible that Burbick tried to hold them up for more money. It's also kind of unclear whether this match was going to be a work, or if it was going to be a shoot. We don't know who the original winner was going to be, certainly. It said that Burbick thought he was going into the ring for a kickboxing match where kicks below the waist would not be allowed. However, this isn't what Takada had agreed to. Some have wondered if this was some sort of communication problem between the two camps, while others think it's more likely that Takada agreed to those terms from Burbick, but had no intention of actually following them. The pair met on December 22nd, 1991 at the fabled Sumo Hall in Tokyo. The fighters enter, the national anthems play, the bell rings and BOOM! Low kick. Just five seconds have passed. Burbick complains and gesticulates immediately about what he thinks is an illegal blow, but the referee tells him to keep fighting. Now of course Takada totally understands Burbick's grievances completely and now knows the rules and will obviously stop throwing low kicks and ah oh, jeez who am I kidding. Takada continues. Burbick complains but it falls on deaf ears. The crowd don't know any better, and react to him with the scorn you would expect. I mean, it just gets even funnier as the seconds tick by. At one point it even looks like the ref is holding on to Burbick's arm, preventing him from getting off the ropes while Takada continues to kick at Burbick's legs hard. Burbick's corner complains, but to absolutely no avail. Burbick continues to complain to Lueff, who does not listen or even slightly ward Takada off, who continues to come forward and kick. The double cross, presumably at this point, was pretty clear. After just two and a half minutes, Burbick says, eh, sod this, and leaves Lewin, Takada being declared the winner by default. <laughs> 
The crowd are quite enraged by what they perceive to be Burbick's act of total cowardice, and Takada has to get on the house mic to calm them down. A good idea, perhaps. If you've seen Vader's debut in New Japan, you know that the Sumo Hall crowd has something of a history of rioting over pro wrestling. This match might just be the funniest of all the ones we're featuring. This is such a hilarious and blatant double cross, masterfully done. Takada, well, as I said, he's a brilliant pro wrestler, but he is kind of a dick. You may wonder if he ever got some sort of comeuppance for these acts of dastardly caddishness, and the answer is, well, not really, but kinda. We've got nothing but time, so we may as well spend a little time in the postscript, as it still keeps us in the land of shooting, and is also important. As we reach the early mid-90s, MMA is starting to take hold in Japan, we're starting to see some good action in Pancrase, Shooter and what have you, and names like Minoru Suzuki, Frank and Ken Shamrock, Masakatsu Funaki and Bas Wooten are becoming famous. A fair amount of this is down to the initial success of Shoot Star as it goes. That did lay the ground for the eventual success of, well, for lack of a better phrase, real fighting. While shoot style is cool, sometimes their wrestlers can believe their own hype a bit, and they can work themselves into a shoot. So, meet the poster boy for working yourself into a shoot, UWFI wrestler and Takada trainee, Yoji Anjo. Yoji's a perfectly fine wrestler, he does have a little bit of a legit background, but no one except him in their right mind would think that enough to challenge someone who was at that point one of MMA's most lethal operators. Hickson Gracie. Yoji was somewhat acting with Takada in mind. Takada himself had repeatedly made public challenges to Hickson and indeed any other Gracie in the Japanese press, probably comfortable in the expectation that said fight was never going to happen. For his part, Hickson Gracie said he'd never fight Takada or anyone else in a pro wrestling ring, but he'd be more than happy to fight elsewhere if they were willing to come on over. And again, Hickson was probably comfortable in the thought that such a thing happening was very unlikely. I'm sure neither he nor Takada were expecting Yoji Anjo to do what he did, which was to go to California, to Hicks and Gracie's gym, and challenge him personally. If you've seen any modern kung fu movie, well you know that challenging someone in their own f***ing dojo is some serious shit. It may as well have been pistols at dawn. At the very least you have to admire Anjo's balls to literally go to Hickson's ends to his manor and do this, if nothing else. We know of one particular thing Hickson has apparently said to Yoji Anjo. It's not fully verified, but it is certainly badass. If we fight for money, I'll stop hitting you when you ask me to. If we fight for honour, I'll stop hitting you when I feel like it. By the way, they were fighting for honour. At this point, Hickson asked the Japanese media that had accompanied Anjo to leave the premises. They would be welcomed back in once the fight was over. Which, as you might expect, didn't take very long. Although it was still long enough for Hicks and Gracie to take Anjo down and beat every last fluid ounce of piss entirely out of his body before putting him to sleep. Sadly no pictures or footage exist of the fight itself. We know that it was recorded, but at the time of this video's creation it's never been made public and it exists only in Hickson's private collection. Those who've seen it largely consist of Hickson's friends, as well as gathered members of the Japanese press who had it shown to them after Anjo came back to Japan and claimed that he'd been jumped. Pictures do exist of the rather badly brayed Yoji in the aftermath, of Gracie celebrating with his trainees, and there's a scan of the rather apologetic note Anjo gave to Hickson a few days later. Now, seeing as Anjo was Takada's trainee, the onus would fall on Takada to get revenge, such is the way of things. Certainly that excited people, what with Takada's reputation as a fighter and all of that, born out of his treatment of folks like Koji Kitao and Trevor Burbick. What not many people outside of Takada knew is that actually, in contrast to a fair few of his trainees who would actually become MMA stars later on, Takada himself couldn't fight a bloody lick. Still, a couple of years later, and following the end of the UWFI, he'd gamely try to get revenge. He faced Hickson at the first Pride show in 1997, with the result you might expect. Takada was dominated very easily by Hickson, who won via armbar submission four minutes into the first round. Big surprise! But what followed was pure pro wrestling. 
Takada stays in Pride, with the aim of beefing himself back up and ultimately challenging Hicks and Gracie again. He defeats Carl Sturgeon, a kickboxer, in an utterly fixed fight at Pride 3, and then faces Hickson again at Pride 4. He does better this time, but Gracie still ultimately wins via armbar in 9 minutes 30 of the first round. So that's sort of a redemption, right? Well, nech. It's pretty much confirmed that Gracie was told to go a little easy on Takada in the second fight, just to at least give it some semblance of a contest. It's known that in preparation for this second fight, Takada was trying to train jiu-jitsu in the US and was routinely getting submitted by frickin' white belts. That's how terrible he was at MMA. Oh, and if you've ever seen his pride win against Mark Coleman, yeah, that was a work too. I mean, that one was bloody obvious, let's face it. It is kind of funny that Takada himself was admittedly so utterly bad at fighting. It's also funny to think this whole thing could have been avoided if Yoji Anjo hadn't been so utterly stupid. Although, to be fair to Yoji, he was happy to make fun of his stupidity later on. It's hilariously ironic to think that despite his complete lack of fighting skills, Takada would train Kazushi Sakuraba, someone who never went too far past the midcard in UWFI, ultimately went into MMA, and became one of the biggest homegrown stars in the sport, specifically for his tendency of hunting down and defeating members of the Gracie family. And again, this silly little story is central to the formation of what would be Japan's biggest MMA promotion, Pride. It's hilarious, but also important. Takada may have been a bad fighter, but he was a star, and the fights with Hickson on Lee's early Pride cards were a big deal, a massive selling point. So, that's the narrative. One that starts from a talented yet unruly superstar with a character and philosophy that inspired a new style of pro wrestling, and leads eventually to the rise and popularity in Japan of MMA itself, all through these moments when people decided to go into business for themselves. Again, this isn't exhaustive. The figure of Inoki looms large, for his own exploits either in mock shoots or real ones made all of this possible, but those perhaps warrant a video all of their own. Hopefully this video manages to show the rise of one of Puro's most different and refreshing genres, and hopefully you've enjoyed it. But until next time, bye for now.